Okay, uh, what I want to deal with this evening is uh, the unemployment controversy. Uh, what causes uh, mass unemployment? What perpetuates it? Uh, uh, what sorts of policies would make possible its uh, elimination and, and prevention? Now, uh, the problem, the basic underlying problem, which uh, might appear uh, to be paradoxical or contradictory, is uh, uh, we've spent considerable time establishing that uh, our needs and desires uh, for wealth have no limit. Uh, the essential element uh, in production is labor. Production is limited only by labor. And uh, that implies an inherent scarcity of labor. Uh, if you stop to think about it, to flesh this out, and I think perhaps we've gone into a few of these points already, uh, what level of, uh, of real income would all of us be capable of living up to if only we could earn it? <coughs> would there be some significant multiple of our present level of income? Would we have any great difficulty figuring out how to live up to a level of income five times what we now earn? No. Uh, ten times what we now earn? No, no not at all. But uh, this uh, by itself is an indication of the fact that uh, labor is enormously scarce in a number of different ways it's an indication. First, at your present average hourly rate of pay, how many hours a week would you have to work to uh, earn five times the income you now earn? 300 hours. Uh, I'm hearing 300 from someone who's uh, apparently working 60 hours a week. And, uh, not enough hours in the day. And there are not enough hours. No There's only 168 hours in the week, but we could easily uh, make good use of an income that at our present rate of pay can only be, could only be earned working uh, 200 hours a week if you work 40 hours a week, or uh, 300 hours if you're already working 60 hours a week. Now, uh, we would like to be able to benefit uh, from the performance of far more labor than we're able to perform. That's what's implied here. If you'd like the income of 200 hours a week, but uh, you're physically unable to work more than 70 or 80, and you don't want to work that much, you also want leisure. So uh, it indicates that the uh, time we have available and are willing to spend working is far, far less than uh, the output we'd like to obtain, the real income that we'd like to obtain. That's uh, a solid indication of the degree of scarcity of labor. You can see it in other ways also. Uh, again, starting from the fact that we'd like uh, a major multiple of our present real incomes, uh, what would be required to achieve it uh, in the present state of technology and the present state of capital equipment? Uh, it wouldn't be enough uh, for people merely to earn five times the money. That would not be so difficult. Uh, the government would just have to manufacture sufficient additional money, and uh, we'd all be earning five times as much as we now earn. Uh, that's already happened uh, over the last uh, couple of generations. Uh, I think the average level of income uh, today in money uh, is perhaps uh, five times or more what it was uh, 30 years ago or 40 years ago. Uh, but that doesn't mean the standard of living is uh, five times higher. Uh, what is the effect merely of increases in the quantity of money and volume of spending uh, on prices <coughs> along with wages? Prices they will raise prices to the same extent as wages, and so uh, there is no uh, real improvement. There's no rise in real wages emanating merely from an increase in the quantity of money. Well, what would we have to do so that uh, earning uh, more money would also represent that much more buying power, what would be needed so that when we spent five times the incomes, it would actually buy five times as much. Increased Pardon me? Increased productivity. Oh, increased production at any rate. We'd have to produce five times as much. And this more brings us demand. back to Say's law. Real demand depends on production and supply. <coughs> but uh, in our present state of technology, uh, with the present uh, methods of production, what would be required to produce five times as much? There's someone said a higher productivity of labor, but we couldn't have a higher productivity of labor uh, with an unchanged uh, technology. So uh, what would be required given the same state of technology? 
additional labor. The performance of additional labor. Again, we'd be back to the uh, need to work five times as much. Uh, so that's an indication of the uh, scarcity of labor uh, uh, along similar lines to what we considered in the case of one individual uh, wanting to uh, uh, be able to earn more money uh, than he's able to. And uh, finally, uh, I suppose we uh, use this class as uh, an illustration of an economic system. Uh, we have uh, maybe 25 or so people here and uh, each of us, I think, would like to uh, have the benefit of the labor of 10 employed either in the production of the goods he buys or in the rendition of the services he enjoys. Uh, just think, I, I doubt that any of us uh, enjoys jumping out of bed, having to uh, cook his own breakfast, make up his bed, on and on, and then he's got to drive himself to work and all. Uh, wouldn't it be so nice to have someone prepare your breakfast, uh, make the bed, drive you to work? We could easily think of uh, how to employ five servants each. Well, uh, uh, this goes to the point that we would all like the benefit of the labor of a substantial number of people, let's say, uh, between the production of goods and the rendition of services, each of us would like the labor of 10. Now, if there are 25 of us in this room, uh, we'd collectively like the labor of 250. But if this uh, class were a self-contained economic system, how much labor would be available uh, for the benefit of the average member of the class? There are 25 of us. Uh, there are 25 of us to consume and 25 of us to produce. So how much labor is available on an average for uh, a member of the class? Yes? The labor of only one. We'd all like the labor of 10 or even more, but uh, the most that's actually available for the average member of any society is the labor of one, and in fact it's uh, significantly less than that because there's a substantial number of very small children in the population, uh, very old and infirm people, and uh, people who for other reasons are unable to work. So uh, the actual labor available uh, per capita is significantly less than one, but at the same time, we'd all like to be able to benefit uh, from the labor of many. Well, that is a confirmation of the scarcity of labor. And it's because labor is scarce that uh, we're always at pains uh, to try to economize on labor, to save labor, to introduce labor-saving machinery, automation, uh, anything that improves the efficiency of production, because that's the only means at our disposal uh, to uh, obtain more uh, goods and wealth with the same limited labor. We need to make it more productive. Uh, to do that, we need to uh, improve the methods of production, uh, adopt more efficient technologies, better capital equipment. <coughs> so if we can take it as established that labor is scarce, well, we also know that uh, at any given time, uh, there's some uh, significant number of people uh, who are unemployed. Uh, there have been periods when there have been masses of people unemployed. And these periods have lasted uh, for some time. Uh, the out leading example in our history was the uh, Great Depression of 1929 to 1940. And we had uh, mass unemployment uh, covering the entire decade of the 1930s. Now, uh, and uh, there's been mass unemployment, at least uh, for a limited time, uh, uh, in conjunction uh, with every substantial depression. As recently as 1982, we had uh, an unemployment rate that temporarily got up uh, in excess of 11 percent. In the uh, depths of the Great Depression, it got as high as uh, 25 percent. All right, so uh, we have uh, two things. Uh, on the one side, there's the uh, scarcity of labor, which I think uh, has to be acknowledged. It is uh, uh, compelling the reasons for it. Uh, yet there's also the uh, the fact of uh, periods of uh, mass unemployment, uh, sustained mass unemployment even. Now, does this represent a contradiction? Is this, uh, uh, do we have a, a principle, labor is scarce? Uh, does the existence of unemployment 
represent a contradiction, a nullification of that principle. Without, without outside influence, that statement's true. With outside influence, the statement becomes false based well, on... Well, is there any way to explain uh, mass unemployment, even uh, sustained mass unemployment, in a way that does not contradict the scarcity of labor? Artificially high wage rates. Yeah, artificially high wage rates, uh, yes, sir. Or uh, lack of raw materials. Or a, or a sudden decrease in raw materials able to, to create supply. All right, uh, Mr. Davis says uh, a, a lack of raw materials, a sudden decrease uh, in the supply of raw materials. Pardon me? That's Dylan. Yeah. Yeah, Dylan. Sorry, Mr. Wright. Uh, uh, yeah, Dylan Wright. Right. Did, did I not say right? You said Mr. Davis. Oh, I'm sorry. No, Excuse me. Okay, uh, Mr. Wright. You give me the credit. Don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, That's a good comment. Uh, Mr. Wright uh, says uh, a lack of raw materials. <coughs> now, uh, that could be the case very, very temporarily, but how can we obtain uh, more of virtually any raw material? Trade. Pardon me? Trade. Well, th th there can be a trade. But more production. More work. You can produce it. Uh, uh, materials are themselves products and uh, the supply of virtually every material, I think practically without exception, can be expanded uh, without even uh, making new discoveries of sources of supply. Um, the uh, lands that we work, uh, the, the source of our materials are uh, agricultural lands and mines. Now, uh, do we work these things uh, to the maximum limit of their capacity as a rule? No, we stop far short of that in accordance with the law of diminishing returns. But that implies that uh, it is possible to get more even from the known uh, deposits, the land already under cultivation, uh, by working it more intensively. Uh, the extra output uh, would be less than proportional to the extra input, but we could still get it. And then uh, there are all kinds of lands uh, which, were not, which are not in cultivation. There are mineral deposits that are already known and identified, but which are not worked because uh, they're not sufficiently productive. Uh, they could be worked. So uh, if we have the labor available, including the labor to produce the equipment, uh, materials are really not a limitation. You might find some uh, exceptional case, but I don't think that would be very significant. So. Uh, it's not really a lack of materials. What's uh, causing uh, the unemployment, as uh, uh, one of the members of the class uh, pointed out, uh, is uh, the, the height of wage rates, or as I would put it, uh, more broadly uh, under point one, uh, the productionist classical economics uh, answer as to why there's uh, unemployment. Uh, it's an inappropriate relationship between prices and wages on the one side and the quantity of money and volume of spending on the other. Uh, specifically, wages and prices are too high relative to the quantity of money and volume of spending. Yes, uh, Mr. Whiteside. All right, so um, I, I, I understand the, the concept of eliminating the artificial wage rates and you know, eliminate or, you know, nullifying or getting rid of the minimum wage. And you know, hence everybody could be employed because everybody's willing. There's somebody out there that's willing to work for some price for something, right? Mm -hmm. You know, in our country or out of our country, there's somebody <coughs> willing to work for 30 cents an hour, or 10 cents an hour. There's somebody in existence that's willing to work for that price. Mm -hmm. I understand that. So, but I'm curious about the monitoring or the the, the how do they monitor unemployment? I mean, I, I just I kind of have a feeling in my heart that it's uh, maybe inaccurate because it's you know the isn't it based on the new registers for unemployment? Well, I think there's more than one method, but uh, one element would certainly be how many people are filing for unemployment insurance. Uh -huh. And then uh, they have estimates of the uh, labor force, uh, the number of people uh, able and willing to work, and uh, I assume they use sampling st techniques. Oh, sampling. Uh, yeah, and find out uh, how many of them are uh, unemployed, seeking employment. Uh, you could get an exact description of the methods employed, I'm sure, from the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. And I think perhaps uh, there's a link uh, to the Department of Labor on the course website. So if you're interested, you can find out precisely how they do it. Okay. But what would, what would be your wider point? 
Well, so at my, my wider point is this, is that people in the United States, you know, some people that are not capitalists or have, a, you know, have been in your class or read your book or whatever, yeah. have this state of mind, you know, especially if they're union employees, that they think that, you know, they're protectionists. They, they don't want to export the jobs, right? Uh -huh. They're opposed yeah. to the exporting of jobs like we talked about last time. Right, right? yeah. Um, but so you eliminate the minimum wage, right? And um, then you're, wh why, would, why would you need to export jobs if you eliminate the minimum wage? Because you could pay somebody the same here in the United States, but you could pay them in India. All right, you're, you're assuming that uh, if we abolished uh, government intervention in wage rates, now that would mean wage rates in the United States would go to the level of India. Well, I, I'm guessing. I don't know. I'm asking okay. you. You're the expert. All right. Well, I mean, this is something that people assume. This is uh, this is a wider issue. Uh, and it's closely connected. Uh, the reason that we have minimum wage laws and uh, pro labor union legislation and uh, other forms of government interference in the labor market is the very widely held belief that if we didn't have it, what would then happen to the level of wages? Increase. They plunge and go down how far? As far as market drives them. Which would be where? Is there any uh, stopping point? Yes. Minimum, the minimum sustenance. Yeah, minimum subsistence. Absolute minimum subsistence. Uh, that's what many, many people think uh, would happen to wages in the absence of government intervention. And so that's why uh, we have such laws on the books. But then when they're on the books, uh, they uh, can easily result in wage rates and prices being too high to have full employment. So uh, it's OK with me if we start the discussion at that point at uh, what is determining real wages. Because if people have in the back of their mind that uh, if we need to have freedom for wage rates to fall, that means, well, yeah, we'll have full employment, but we'll be earning subsistence wages. Well, uh, I think maybe we'd better start with uh, disabusing that idea right away. And uh, so let's jump ahead uh, to later discussion in uh, tonight's supplement, uh, the, the productivity theory of wages, an alternative to the exploitation theory. The exploitation theory, which uh, stems largely from Karl Marx, uh, is the belief that if we have uh, a free labor market, if the government is not involved, if it doesn't sanction uh, labor union coercion, uh, then wages go to minimum subsistence. And I think uh, that what makes this uh, belief plausible, there are two components that I'm refer referring to now uh, under point one, the plausibility <coughs> of the exploitation theory. There are two related aspects. Uh, one can be thought of as worker need, uh, the other employer greed, for short. Uh, the worker need refers to the fact that the immense majority of workers need to uh, work and have a source of, of wages within a very short time. Uh, there are very few workers uh, who can afford to be without work uh, for a period of months. Uh, still fewer uh, who could afford to be without work for a year. Uh, many uh, are living from paycheck to paycheck, and they need to work very, very quickly. So here are the workers. Uh, they need to work in order to avoid starvation. And it's assumed that, uh, therefore, uh, since they're willing to work uh, for as little as what will just barely keep them alive, uh, they can actually be had for such a minimum price, that the workers are willing, if necessary, if they had no alternative, they would work for minimum subsistence. And we can agree that's true. Uh, there are many places around the world, like India and China, uh, where people are working to the limit of their capacity and just barely surviving, in the strictest sense of the term, just uh, getting enough rice or whatever else they may be eating, and uh, that's it, and they're breaking their backs to do that. And people uh, would be willing to do that rather than die of starvation. And it's usually assumed that, well, if that's what the workers are willing to do, uh, that means uh, they're practically there. Because then on the other side, uh, what kind of wages uh, do employers prefer to pay, as does any buyer in paying any price? Well, They'd rather uh, pay a lower price than a higher price. Well, it's assumed that if you have this combination where the workers on the one side are willing to take as little as minimum subsistence, 
and the employers on the other side are out to pay as little as they possibly can, then if that combination is unleashed, uh, the greed of the employers to pay as little as they can uh, will drive wages down and there'll be no point of resistance to the fall in wages short of minimum subsistence. So let's thought, uh, let's say wages right now are up here at this level, uh, but uh, think of this uh, height of wage rates as resting on a kind of scaffolding, the scaffolding being uh, government intervention, pro-union legislation, minimum wage laws, maximum hours laws, uh, child labor prohibitions. Uh, so it's thought, I think by the immense majority of people, this is what keeps uh, wage rates where they are. And now uh, resting against this is the self-interest of the employers, uh, which as far as it can, wants to drive wages down. Okay, what will allegedly happen if we yank away uh, the government intervention? Then the scaffolding is gone, and uh, wages are being pushed down uh, by the action of a lead ball falling in a cylinder, and there's uh, no point of resistance, supposedly, short of minimum subsistence. I think that's how uh, things stand in the minds of most people. Yes, Mr. Corman. So if the minimum wage were abolished, would it affect people on salary? Would the minimum wage, would the abolition affect people on salary? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think in a significant way. Uh, there'd be some things that they'd probably be able to buy cheaper. Uh, they wouldn't the, have to the pay as taxes. Would not be affected materially, would they? I don't think so. Uh, they, their taxes could be reduced somewhat to the extent they presently have to support uh, the unemployed. Mm -hmm. uh, prices of things they buy uh, could be reduced somewhat to the extent more people were working. Yes, Mr. Weatherford. Can it be simplified by just saying this? If minimum wages were abolished yeah. and wages were allowed to fall, prices would have to fall. Mm -hmm. You couldn't, the, the retailer or producer could not maintain the same price levels because no one would be able to buy the product. Everybody's wages are lower. So the prices must fall. Right, prices would fall, that's true. Uh, but the Marxists, uh, when they are confronted with that, they say another paradox of capitalism is that uh, the system does not pay enough to buy the product. So uh, they think uh, this is the, the cause of depressions. So there's more, that we, you are right though in, in observing that prices would have to fall and that's something we're gonna look at uh, as we elaborate things. Yes, uh, Mr. Muraski. It would, would it have to fall also because since the employers can pay so much less, that it's going to cost them so much less to make it in the same aspect. Yeah, the, the, the demand would be down, uh, the cost of production would be down. I shouldn't say the demand would be down. Uh, would be the same, but the cost of production would be The cost of production would be less, the supply would be greater. But uh, this is getting a little ahead. What I want to do as the first order of business is to uh, attack uh, the, these two uh, alleged uh, grounds uh, of, of the plausibility of the exploitation theory. And uh, I want to do so, uh, I'll start with the uh, issue of worker need. Uh, I think I, uh, let's see, where do I have this? Okay. Now, I want to take a, a very similar type example and develop it uh, to lay the groundwork. Uh, let's start with the case. Uh, you have a very uh, new, high quality automobile, in excellent condition, uh, which you bought uh, very recently. Now, uh, your company is offering you a promotion, uh, which you think is uh, maybe <coughs> making your career in the long run. And so you're definitely going to accept this promotion. But it will require you uh, to live in, in Manhattan Island in New York City. In, uh, you're, you'll have a job in Midtown Manhattan and uh, you'll need to, to live in that area. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, garage fees in uh, Manhattan, but uh, they're comparable to apartment rents in most parts of the country on a monthly basis. So. Uh, Let's assume that uh, the garage fee, which might be 1500 a month possibly, uh, on that order, uh, that's beyond your present means. If you can't afford to garage your car, your alternative is to park it on the street, uh, and they have alternate side of the street parking, but only every other day. So 
uh, every other day you'd have to clear out uh, or else your car would be towed uh, and the only way you can uh, find a spot is if uh, you can pull into uh, one of these alternate side of the street parking areas uh, an hour before it becomes legal. So if there's a no parking zone 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, if you can get there perhaps around 1 p.m. and then sit in your car till 2 p.m., uh, you'll have a parking space and you won't get a ticket. Or if a cop comes along, uh, he'll let you move uh, so he won't write you up. But uh, if you have a serious job, uh, you can't afford to take off time like this. So you can't afford to garage the car, you have no way to park it. What are you going to do with the car if you're definitely committed to moving? Sell it. You have to sell it. Okay. Now, how little would you be willing to sell it for? Break even. Okay. Now you say break even. That's Either imagine. Estimate or what you owe. Uh, you you paid twenty thousand for it or whatever, and now if you can't get twenty thousand or the amount of your loan, you're saying, well, I won't sell it. <coughs> well, then are you uh, giving up the promotion? You're calling up the boss, say, sorry, boss, uh, I can't accept this uh, career making uh, uh, move because uh, I'm not getting enough for my car. What if you decide to live in New Jersey and just commute? Well, then you might have to do that, but then you have a problem. You might have to get up at 5 in the morning. Uh, and so... You still need a parking spot. Pardon me? You still need a parking spot. No, you could take a train right from New Jersey. All right, well, then, then you could keep it. But we're assuming you're in midtown Manhattan. And that's the conditions. Another example would be you own a grand piano, a beautiful, uh, fine grand piano. Uh, you presently live in a large house. Uh, you're moving into a small apartment. You just can't fit the piano in the apartment. What must you do? You'll have to sell it. Okay. If you have uh, a commitment which you've made, which is incompatible with your keeping either the car or the grand piano or whatever it may be, you must sell it. And how little would you be willing to sell it for if you had no better alternative? The best you could get, but what would be the minimum that you'd take? A dollar. Uh, yes? Sure, you would, take yeah. as, you would take as little as you could possibly be going to get for it, but at the same time, wouldn't you be able to use it as a write-off? Well, you could. Because you're going to take a loss. All right, you take a loss, you have a write-off. But I mean, you're saying that this is if you have a job offer and you have to move and you have to get rid of these things, and you need to, you know... The, the point is, I'm, I'm trying to establish that on the one side, the seller would be willing to give the thing away for nothing in the extreme case. In fact, he'd even be willing to call up a, a towing company and pay them to take it off his hands if, the, if he had no alternative. I just want to uh, develop a situation where the seller is willing uh, to give the thing away for nothing or even pay to have it removed. I want that to be the background. And then we'll see if that is relevant to the price he can actually obtain. Yes, Mr. Corman. Uh, this happened about 15 years ago. I actually moved, went from California to New York. Yeah. And uh, actually, I lived in Jersey and commuted to Manhattan. Yeah. And before I had moved, I actually purchased a, a new couch that I paid a uh, thousand dollars. A new what? Couch. Yeah. And the apartment that I rented in Jersey, um, the stairs were too narrow, an over house. And the stairs were too narrow to get it up to the second floor. There's no way to lift it and get it in the window, so I had to sell it. Mm -hmm. About $175, I think. It was a brand new couch. Okay, that would, that's a good illustration. And if you couldn't have gotten 175, You'd have sold it for seventy-five, probably would have, or five. Uh, so, I mean, so put it on the curb, or, or put it on the curb, uh, pay, pay someone to take it away. <laughs> yes, Ms. Herrera. Um, another example is I mean, most of most of my classmates already know who I am and like me, and they know my background. And when my father took go, we all had to move back home. Yeah. It was my sister and her husband, with myself, and I already lived alone. And well, not so my dad had a stuff. He had a boat because he was a fisherman. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't sell the boat. We all needed to make all these changes right away. So I ended up giving it away to the Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're a tax right now. Okay. okay. So, I mean, I had, I, we all had to, like, make some quick changes because right. you didn't have a chance to think, but we, we needed to uh, reconstruct our lives or reorganize, and that's what I had to do. Okay. All right, that, that's an example. 
So uh, we, we have cases, we have cases where uh, people are willing in an extremity uh, to uh, give their goods away for free. Uh, they must get rid of it or even pay to have them taken off their hands. All right, now, uh, let us make the assumption that uh, everyone uh, who sold his automobile, every uh, uh, owner of a, uh, every owner of a, an automobile, an individual, uh, not the, the dealers, but uh, the individual automobile owners, let's assume that uh, in uh, calendar year uh, 2003, every single individual who sold his car was for some somehow in exactly this position that he would have been willing to pay to have the car removed and we want to consider would that have had any significant effect on the average price of automobiles yes. uh, the way we could describe this situation is uh, in this diagram uh, here's the number of, uh, of previously owned automobiles that are being sold into the market and we'll call it quantity A of automobiles and all of the owners are willing, if necessary, to pay to have the cars taken off their hands. So I've extended this uh, supply line below uh, the origin. It's in a negative area. Uh, they're willing to, take, to, to pay to have it removed or uh, uh, to get the very best price they can. And they'd like a price up here if they could get it or up, up on the 10th floor if they could get that. Now, uh, if this is the demand uh, for uh, these uh, previously owned automobiles, if, if it's the case that we only have quantity A of them available, but the quantity of such automobiles that people would like to acquire is greater than A, and uh, here it, it can be substantially greater than A, is there anything that's going to determine the price apart from the personal valuations of the sellers? Uh, are, are the personal valuations of the sellers actually relevant to the price? What, what is actually determining the price? Uh, is it uh, the personal valuations of the sellers or rather the limitation of the quantity they have available to sell together with the demand? It's the valuation of sellers. It's, pardon me? Valuation of the sellers. You say it's the valuations of the sellers? Well, the sellers are willing to take as little as zero or a negative number. <coughs> Does that uh, determine the price? No. 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 It's the limitation of the supply together with the demand. Now, in a case of this kind, the price is determined uh, from the, by the competition of the buyers for a scarce supply. The supply is limited. Uh, maybe it's uh, five million such automobiles. I don't know how many uh, secondhand cars are sold in a year. But uh, if there's some definite delimited number, uh, such as five million, and uh, there are people interested in acquiring more than five million uh, such automobiles, in other words, if they're scarce, then there's going to be a price formed on the basis of the combination of the limitation of supply and the, uh, and the demand, the competition of the buyers. So here we would have a case, uh, all of the sellers are willing uh, to give their thing away for free or even pay to have it removed, and that is irrelevant to the market price that's formed, which is determined by the combination of the scarcity of the item and the demand, the limitation of supply uh, together with the demand. Uh, the price is determined by, uh, as we'll see in a moment, the competition of the buyers for the scarce supply. Yes, uh, Ms. Nikolova. A good example of that is, for example, um, buying convertible cars. By what? Convertible cars. Convertible cars. Uh, right before the summer, during the summer, especially BMW convertibles are very scarce and yeah. you cannot find them. So yeah. the prices go up dramatically. Yeah. And as soon as the winter comes, the prices will go much lower. Okay. Okay, but uh, that's, that's true, but what we want to stress is that even if the sellers are willing uh, to accept a horrendously low price, zero price, a negative price, their willingness is irrelevant in such circumstances. It doesn't count. What's determining the price is being determined at a much higher point than zero. It's determined up here uh, because of the combination of the limitation of supply uh, together with the demand. Now, I want to look at the other element that makes uh, the exploitation theory appear plausible, uh, the employer greed aspect, the fact that uh, the employer, like any other buyer, would rather pay less than more. 
Now that's certainly true. Every buyer does prefer to pay less rather than more, and so do employers uh, when they're employing workers. But we need to analyze this a little more closely and see uh, just how relevant this is. Uh, does it imply that they can therefore drive prices, that drive wages to minimum subsistence or prices of other things to zero? And let me take as an illustration uh, the, the situation of an auction. And we have an auction, and we have uh, this one rare uh, first edition uh, of this uh, great book. It it, it'll be autographed, so that uh, will make it much more valuable. And we have uh, two uh, two bidders, uh, two dollar. people, two people who are interested. No, not not a dollar. I can get away from that. You might try. We'll let you try in a minute. Okay. We'll have, and there's Mr. Whitesides. Uh, he values this book. Uh, up to a limit of $2,000. Uh, anything above $2,000, that's too high. But at $2,000, his marginal utility uh, exceeds $2,000. So the test, the test yeah, the test, the test is on the last page. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 3000 <laughs> okay. 3, okay. Now, uh, here's Mr. Woody. Uh, he values the book as highly as $1,000. Mr. Whitesides would rather pay two hundred dollars than 2000 Better still, 20 than 200, and even a dollar, as he indicated. All right, well, suppose Mr. Whiteside uh, goes into the auction and uh, refuses to bid more than 200 or a dollar, whatever. I'd say he names, he, he'd rather pay a very low price, so he'll say, uh, here's a dollar. What's going to happen? Not going to get a loser. Mr. Woody will walk away with a buck. Now, is that the outcome that Mr. Whiteside wants? No. That is not the outcome. He wants the book. Now, th this example, I think, implies uh, what his <coughs> rational self-interest is, what the rational self-interest of a buyer is. It is not to attempt to pay the lowest price you could imagine or the lowest price you would like to pay. The irrational self-interest is to pay the lowest price that is simultaneously too high for any other buyer who otherwise would obtain the thing in your place. So Mr. Whiteside's actual self-interest is to try to pay the lowest price that is still too high for Mr. Woody which would be, in our example, 1,001. That, this is rational self-interest. If he bids lower than that and refuses to budge, then uh, Mr. Woody walks away with the item. Uh, Mr. Whitesides does not achieve what he wants to achieve. So uh, the principle here is the rational self-interest of a buyer, including employers, is not to try to pay the lowest price they can imagine or would like, but the lowest price that's simultaneously too high for any other buyer who otherwise would obtain the thing in their place. And this will apply uh, to any situation, not just to two bidders uh, for one unit, but we could have uh, uh, two million bidders uh, for one million units. It's to the interest of the uh, strongest million bidders uh, to pay enough to make it too expensive uh, for any of the members of the second million potential bidders uh, to obtain instead of them. Uh, it's to the interest of buyers, those who really value the item, uh, to make it too expensive for other people to obtain in place of them. Now, uh, so this is how the, the competition of buyers determines the price. It's to the self-interest of uh, all the buyers who value the item uh, from the price P1 and up. It's to their self-interest that the price be here at E and not lower. Because if the price were lower, it would mean that some of the units would be purchasable by buyers who didn't value it as highly. And what would that do to the supply available for those who valued it at E and above? It would deprive the supply. It would deprive them of their supply. It would be exactly the same as Mr. Whiteside's letting Mr. Woody walk off with a good. Now, so there was a question in the rear somewhere? OK. Now. Uh, this situation applies to the labor market. And here, uh, I've drawn a supply curve of labor, which is essentially identical with this uh, supply curve of used cars or grand pianos or whatever, uh, with one difference, uh, that no one will work for less than minimum subsistence, uh, indicated by the letter M. Mm. So here's minimum subsistence. Uh, no, everyone is willing to work uh, for that much and then more, but they are willing to work for as little as minimum subsistence. Now, does that mean that the wage uh, will actually be at minimum subsistence if this is the supply of labor and here's the demand for labor? 
the, the willingness of the workers to work for as little as minimum subsistence is irrelevant to the wages they actually have to accept. That wage is determined by the scarcity of the labor in question together with the demand. And there is competition among the employers for labor. And we'll uh, look at this more closely. Uh, here we are, I uh, have a diagram, employer competition versus a labor shortage. Uh, employer competition versus a labor shortage. Now uh, this is the identical diagram we just looked at, uh, but elaborated. Uh, here's the equilibrium wage at W sub 1. This is an equilibrium wage. Uh, here's the supply of labor at A. And this is where the market will set wage rates, even though the workers are willing all to work for minimum subsistence. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm going to uh, try to demonstrate here is that any wage below W sub 1, any wage below this equilibrium, uh, such as a wage down at L or W sub 2, uh, this, I call it L for low wage, H is high wage. <coughs> All right, if the wage were lower at W sub 2, what happens to the quantity of labor demanded? It's greater, it's out at B, but there's only A available. And to the extent that the wage were down at W sub 2, that would enable employers in this zone, employers not able or willing to pay the wage uh, of W1, they could now afford labor or afford more labor than they otherwise could have. Well, what happens to the extent that these low-wage employers actually succeed in employing workers? Suppose they were to employ a, a, a number of workers equal to A, B. So they employed A, B of workers, because they could afford to do so at this low wage. Well, what does that imply about the number of workers available to these other employers able and willing to pay higher wages? from uh, W1 all the way on up to W3. Less workers available for that. There's correspondingly fewer workers for them. You know, there's only A of workers, and the number AB are employed by these lower wage employers, then the supply available for the higher wage employers is equivalently reduced. It's exactly the same in principle as uh, Mr. Woody walking off with the good at the low price and it being unavailable to Mr. Uh, Whitesides. But what is the interest, what is the self-interest of these employers who, if the wage is down here and their labor is going to other employers not able uh, to pay as much, where does their self-interest lie if they want to have that labor? Yes? To bid up wage rates. You see, by bidding up wage rates, they make it too expensive for these employers, and so the labor is released to them. Mr. Foster? I understand uh, what you're describing to us, but I can't help but to think about us, the Democrats, the way that they explain minimum wages mm -hmm. to curb crime. Because for myself, and I don't want to be too aggressive, mm -hmm. but before I take minimum sustenance, mm -hmm. I'm going to take yours. That's what, that's what I have to do to feed okay. my children. Okay. And I just want to see how that plays in here, because I see myself above that M at all times. Okay. But I understand that I don't necessarily have a say so in what I get from an employee. Okay. So how does crime and you know deterrence of crime and minimum wage play in? Okay. Now you say what you hear uh, from certain politicians. You said Democrats is, uh, if I understand you correctly, that uh, a reason we need the minimum wage is to reduce crime, uh, so that uh, people who are working uh, won't be tempted to steal. Okay, but now, if, uh, if we have the minimum wage, what is the effect on the number of people who are working? Uh, th they're unemployed, they're earning nothing, right? Uh, what do they do? <coughs> They'll be stealing. Now, I would say uh, the worst victims of the minimum wage law uh, are black teenagers. They have the highest unemployment rate, and when the general unemployment rate is perhaps five or six percent, they may have a 30% unemployment rate because uh, they're among the least skilled uh, people in the society. So uh, they're where the unemployment rate, they're the ones who are unemployed. Yes. Now, uh, they could be employed at lower wages. Now, they wouldn't be earning a hell of a lot. They'd be earning very, very little, but it's still much more than nothing. And then they'd have some money, and then uh, I would think their temptation the steel should be less, plus if they are working, they, they can be learning some skills on the job and becoming capable of earning some more money after a while when they have 
some work experience and have learned some things, uh, then they, they can be absorbed into the system. This way, they never acquire these skills, and they're a permanent underclass, and they have no way to make a decent living. So there'll still be a higher crime rate then? But no, not a higher crime rate. I'd say a lower crime rate. What, what, you see, uh, and you have, there's a combination of things. There's uh, the, the minimum wage, uh, which uh, prevents them from getting jobs. And then there's more. Uh, you see, if we examine this a little further, suppose we wanted to make it possible for unemployed people uh, who would have to work at some wage presently below the minimum wage, Suppose we wanted to do everything we could to make their life easier uh, so that they could be employed uh, on better terms than that. Well, uh, what, would, what puts the uh, wage so low, what would make it so low uh, to absorb the present unemployed is that we have uh, an artificial increase in the number of people at the bottom of the ladder. See, so think for a moment, what is the effect of anything that uh, sets uh, higher than market wage scales higher up the ladder. Uh, what, what is the effect, let's say, of a carpenter's union? Uh, well, first of all, it raises the wage rates of the carpenters, right? But uh, when the wage rates of the carpenters are artificially increased, what does that do to the number of people who can be employed as carpenters? It reduces, reduces it. Now, where do the people go who otherwise would have been carpenters? Well, they have to go somewhere else. So what happens to the supply of labor in the, uh, in the other lines where they go? That's increased. And what is the effect on the level of wages there needed to absorb them? That's decreased. Now suppose uh, there are other unions operative there. And so uh, the wage rates can't fall, but uh, maybe these uh, displaced carpenters, maybe they're somewhat more intelligent, more capable, uh, so they can be employed. But then what happens to other people who would have worked in those areas? So they're displaced. And uh, you have a pressure uh, accumulating down at the bottom which means that uh, if the only wage that's uncontrolled is at the bottom, well, you could have full employment, but it'll be at a very low wage. What would make it possible to have full employment uh, for the least skilled members of society uh, on better terms uh, than are presently possible? What would alleviate the pressure on their wages? Make it possible for more people to be employed higher up the ladder and so reduce the pressure at the bottom? eliminate the artificially high wages further up. In other words, abolish the pro-union legislation. See, if you abolish the pro-union legislation, you take the pressure off at the, at the bottom end of the scale. And the combination of these things would be, we'd have lower costs of production, we'd also have uh, greater work efficiency, and uh, so there'd be lower prices, and you'd have uh, full employment, and everyone could be employed uh, on better terms than today. <laughs> yes. What? Uh, it was funny. It was like all these hands shot. Just kind of Mr. Wilson. Add on to that. Uh, what about now when you take into fact, I mean, you kind of outlined, you've got, you know, union labor, you've got, you know, a section of the population that's, you know, fighting for minimum wage or they're, they're stealing in a sense because mm -hmm. they're a larger majority of unemployed. Now you also then throw in immigrant labor, which is oftentimes being paid lower than minimum wage mm -hmm. um, because they're undocumented workers. Yeah. So they're putting a strain on, on, the, uh, on the labor force, too. Are they, in a sense, then squeezing that, that middle section? Are the um, immigrant workers uh, squeezing anybody? Well, what kind of jobs are they taking? I think uh, they're taking uh, jobs uh, of the kind that uh, hardly anyone in the uh, native population wants at all. Now, uh, uh, so uh, I, I don't think uh, they're causing harm, and that's the idea. I, I think we dealt with that in our discussion of consumptionism. The idea uh, that there's room for just so many workers, well, how much labor is there room for? There's no limit. And uh, let me uh, add something in further. Uh, if you look at uh, immigration over a longer term, if you look at immigration over a term, <coughs> let's say of two generations or so, uh, you might start off with lots of immigrants. They don't know the language. Uh, they're working at the very bottom. But uh, many of them will work their way higher, and they'll have children uh, who uh, can be born knowing the language. That is, if we don't force them into bilingual education. And so uh, th they could do certainly better. Now, what difference does it make in the long run uh, if you have uh, large numbers of people who otherwise would have had to spend their lives 
uh, in places like Mexico or in previous generations in places like Poland or Italy or whatever, uh, what kind of chances uh, for the development of, the, of an individual's talents uh, exist in such places? Where? Pardon me? There are very few. There are very few. Uh, there's very little opportunity. Now, uh, if these people can move uh, from such places into a free country, and we may not be that free, and we may not be free enough anymore, but uh, we were uh, in the 19th century and for most of the 20th century, if they can move into a relatively free country, uh, what can they do with their talents? They can develop them, right? And then what is the effect of their being able to develop their talents, uh, especially if it's considerable talent? Uh, like uh, Andrew Carnegie was an immigrant from Scotland. Suppose he had had to spend his life in Scotland. Suppose uh, Sikorsky, the inventor of the helicopter, had had to remain in Poland or Russia, wherever he was from. <coughs> Uh, what do you think would have been uh, their contribution uh, to uh, the industries that they later greatly improved? Nil. Virtually nil. So if you can have a, a larger number of talented people uh, moving from uh, a, an area of lack of freedom into a free country, uh, you're unlocking human talent. And what effect do you think that that has to have uh, on the productivity of labor? That has to raise it and improve the standard of living. <coughs> so I would say uh, the long run effect of uh, freer immigration uh, is positive. And in the shorter run, uh, the effect is there might be some uh, element of the population, the least skilled, uh, they could conceivably experience greater pressure, but what would be the effect on the middle class? <laughs> Pardon me? The goods would be expensive. Well, what about the ability of the middle class to afford servants? Uh, well, today, hardly anyone, you have to be quite wealthy to afford any kind of servant. But uh, if you had uh, larger scale immigration, uh, the middle class could. And then in the longer run, uh, you'd have uh, a general rise in the productivity of labor. Yes, Mr. Richards. So what you're advocating is if you had more immigration, would these people be taxed? Because I know the big argument with the illegal immigration is right now is they're not paying any taxes and they're draining the school systems. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that they would be required to pay taxes? So it's some form of, of legal immigration as opposed to people just coming across the border? All right, let me defer that. Mr. Weatherford wants to say something. Two things. Actually, to that point, uh, the majority of illegal immigrants that are working are paying federal taxes, but the resources they're taking are local. Schools, okay. health care, that kind of thing. Mm. That's the problem with illegal immigration. Mm. Uh, biggest question I have is, this is a very wide-ranging question. Yeah. Most of the theories you expounded in the last six weeks involve less government intervention, the abolishment of uh, union uh, laws, in essentially increased freedom yeah. in this uh, economy. My, my question is this. If yeah. you were elected president in November, yeah. how could this be turned into a real system in America today? I, I don't think it can be within uh, one term or even two terms of office. So what you would need is uh, a whole political movement uh, accepting a, a fundamental political philosophy and working at it over a period of a generation or two. See, the same way we got to where we are today, that didn't happen right. in four years or eight years. It's a, the result of a succession of moves a decade after decade. So it might not take as long to undo it, but you'd have to allow uh, for some considerable period of time. Uh, some things might take 30 or 35 years to phase out, like Social Security. Right. I mean, to go back to the illegal immigration question, I'd be all for absolutely open borders if you would eliminate welfare. Well, the yeah. other issue, that is a security issue. If you have an open borders, then you've got to be... But what I was wondering is, if you're advocating freer... Because I know in the old days when people used to come over, they would have jobs, they would pay taxes, but it seems like there's a big underground economy where people are not paying taxes, they're working illegally, because employers don't want to admit that they're hiring them, okay. and these people are draining the, the resources. Right. These yeah. people also are getting under minimum wage, so there is no uh, minimum wage for those type of people. They're getting paid whatever they can get paid. Mm -hmm. So the government cannot interfere 
that yeah well yeah. I guess what I'm saying is should we should these people pay taxes and be legal immigrants okay there are a number of things uh, it's true uh, the, the immigrants may be putting a burden on hospital emergency rooms and uh, the school system and various other uh, government activities so uh, the circumstances in which uh, free immigration would be a, a boon rather than uh, the cause of problems would be uh, if the government weren't involved in these things. Like suppose uh, the government does not have an obligation to provide free education and the immigrants have to deal with that on their own and with health care and whatever. So uh, when the immigrants come, they're not coming uh, to get on the welf on welfare rolls or anything of that kind and raise your taxes. Suppose when they come, they have to be entirely self-supporting. <coughs> In that context, I think they'd be a benefit. Now, if we have a massive immigration and the result is uh, <coughs> swollen uh, taxes to pay for them, uh, then it can be a loss. So uh, what we need, uh, before you could have really f uh, fully free immigration, uh, you need to have a much freer economy than we now have. What's uh, making immigration a problem is the extent of uh, a violation of economic freedom within the domestic economy. Yes, uh, Mr. Wilson. Kind of, kind of run all over back to the labor side. There, but wouldn't if you were controlling immigration, wouldn't you be able then to, you know, kind of get rid of that unemployment because you have, you're basically using all your labor, internal labor resources for everything and then, you know, kind of monitoring what comes in from the external sources to help, you know, regulate well, or increase that growth. But, you see, there could be some uh, element of truth in that if and to the extent that the immigrants were doing the same jobs as the uh, native-born workers. But very heavily, uh, they're doing jobs that uh, native-born Americans don't even want to do. Yeah, but if those, if those, I mean, if the immigrants weren't there doing it, then the native-born, there would be the demand for the native-born workers to be doing it. Well, no, not necessarily. Uh, the, 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 if they're not willing to take those jobs, <coughs> if they have uh, better alternatives, then they don't do it. Well, so, what you're saying then is they'd be willing to forego minimum wage to not take those jobs, you know, and, and therefore not be employed by choice. Uh, well, uh, to the extent they uh, can get public support, then uh, they have that option. But you see, uh, I don't think there's a fundamental uh, conflict uh, between immigrants and native-born uh, citizens, because uh, that would only be true if there were a limited number of jobs. Is there a limited number of jobs? No, there isn't. So there is room for everybody. Yes, uh, Mr. Weatherford. The only argument to that would be the change in not immigration patterns, but we mentioned the immigration of uh, you know, Italians or Poles or whatever the case may be, when those people came over to this country, or the Irish, yeah. they had no choice. They had to stay here. They didn't have the money to go back. Uh, Ireland, Italy, etc., were far away. Yeah. Uh, today, with the local immigration problem in the Southwest, yeah. uh, namely, you know, illegal immigration from Mexico, yeah. these people do not intend to stay in America, do not intend necessarily to retire here. They want to make money, earn jobs, and go back to Mexico. I right, well, really it, have the intention to If that were really true, then uh, it would be a very delimited problem. But Because yeah. you get some, and then there's some resident uh, population, and then they're constantly going back, matching the number coming in. But uh, I think many of them do stay. But uh, I would say uh, what makes that problem worse is we have bilingual education. And so uh, there's a tendency toward the development of two cultures in the same territory. Uh, the earlier immigrants were, were integrated and they became Americans. And that's uh, how it should be uh, for, for the newer immigrants too. Okay, well, here we are. Uh, the main point in connection with uh, the self-interest of the employers is that uh, a wage below the market wage uh, creates a labor shortage. Here's the supply of labor. If the wage is below W1, uh, the quantity of labor demanded exceeds the supply available uh, to the extent that employers uh, who require a lower wage in order to be able to employ a labor, to the extent they succeed in getting it, uh, quantity AB, uh, that equivalently reduces the supply available for other employers able and willing to pay more. If the wage is down here, 
and uh, these low-wage employers are able to employ the quantity AB, well, that reduces the quantity by an equivalent amount, AC, uh, for the employers able and willing to pay this wage or even higher. That's against their interests. And when you have conditions of that kind, uh, the employers become willing uh, to conspire with the workers to evade the law. Uh, we had a situation uh, uh, like this under President Carter. Uh, we had a period of much more rapidly rising prices. And in the uh, Carter administration, uh, the federal government imposed what it called wage price guidelines. And part of them was uh, the attempt to limit the rise in wages uh, to some uh, specified percentage if I recall correctly, it was 6%. They were trying to uh, prevent uh, any firms from raising wages more than 6% in a year, uh, thinking that that will uh, serve to restrain the rise in prices. How many of you remember that? Okay, some of you. Now, in that environment, if the market conditions are such that in the absence of this interference, wages would be rising 8 or 10%, and what would make them rise like that is a rapid inflation of the money supply. If the market conditions are calling for a rise in wages of 8 or 10 percent, and employers are being limited to 6 percent, well, what will be happening to the demand for labor uh, if wages are rising only 6 percent, while uh, the quantity of money is out there uh, being boosted and sharply raising the demand for labor? Uh, what will happen uh, to the number of workers employers are seeking to employ compared with the number available, at least in many important skill areas. What situation would you have? <coughs> Pardon me? High unemployment. What do you think high unemployment? If here we are, let's say we start off, uh, the wage oh, in some occupation uh, is uh, 20,000 a year. And the conditions are such that if the government does nothing, next year that same job will pay 22000 yeah. And the government wants to limit the rise uh, to uh, 21500 or something on that order. But if that happens, uh, what, what will be the effect on the quantity of such uh, labor demanded uh, at a wage of 21500 compared with a wage of 22? Yeah. There will be a higher quantity demanded, and what happens if the quantity of that labor demanded exceeds the supply of that labor available. The wage rate goes down. Well, it wouldn't go down. You have a labor shortage. You have a labor shortage. Now, when there's a labor shortage, when there are more jobs available than there are workers to fill them, well, uh, what stops uh, some of the workers that uh, people have from simply leaving and finding other such jobs, uh, maybe closer to home, or that they offer somewhat nicer conditions, uh, what can you do to retain your workers? You have great difficulty keeping the workers, and uh, how are you going to get additional workers? Well, you have great difficulty doing that. You just may not be able to, because they're all working uh, <coughs> elsewhere. So uh, what is to the self-interest of an employer uh, who wants uh, to keep his workers and possibly get more? He must pay more. It's to his self-interest to raise wage rates. And in that context, it was to the self-interest of employers to violate the spirit of the guidelines. Uh, and the way they did that was uh, by giving out phony promotions. You see, uh, the guidelines said uh, you can uh, raise a wage only as much as 6%. But what if uh, you're not just raising the guy's wage in his present job, you're promoting him uh, to a higher paying job? Well, uh, that's still legal. So uh, if uh, the promotion would have entailed a 5% uh, increase, and now here you are, you're saying, okay, uh, we promoted him, and we're raising, giving him a raise of 5%, so uh, we're within the, the limit. We're giving him 5% for his promotion, and then 5% uh, on top of that uh, within the guidelines. So uh, you've actually succeeded in raising his wage 10%, but uh, you've still complied with the guidelines. And this was a fairly common practice, and employers were doing it. Uh, they were violating the spirit of the law uh, because uh, that was what they needed to do to retain and uh, increase the number of workers they wanted. So uh, this does happen. Now, uh, when uh, employers will not uh, uh, do this, when they won't raise wages, 
Uh, suppose we have a situation uh, where the wage, instead of being artificially low, suppose it's artificially high. It's up here at W sub 3. Now in that case, what is the quantity of labor demanded compared to the supply available? I mean, the quantity demanded is less than the supply available, so uh, there'll be unemployment equal to AC. Now, in this situation, uh, where does the self-interest of employers lie? And also, the self-interest of the unemployed workers, the workers in the portion AC. To bid wage rates down. See, when you have unemployed workers available who could do the same kind of job as your present workers, in that environment, you can say, okay, you guys, you either must take a cut or you'll be replaced because there's a group of people from whom they can be replaced. And it's to the self-interest of the people without jobs uh, to be willing to work for less. But as that process goes on, what is the effect on the quantity of labor demanded? Increase. It will increase and put an end to the unemployment. So the wage will settle back at W sub 1. <coughs> Uh, the, the, there is room for wage rates to fall. It is to the self-interest of employers to reduce wage rates when there is unemployment and available workers who are unemployed who could replace the present workers. But if there are no uh, uh, un, uh, unemployed workers to do that, uh, then it's not to their self-interest to try to reduce wages. And when there is unemployment, the reduction in wages serves to eliminate the unemployment. Now. Uh, if we can hold in mind that uh, wage rates in the market are not determined arbitrarily, the fact that uh, the wage earners are willing to work for subsistence, the employers would like to pay less rather than more, that these things are actually irrelevant to what they have to pay, that what they have to pay is governed uh, by the supplies of the different types of labor, uh, together with such things as the uh, quantity of money in the economy, uh, the preferences of the consumers, uh, for products using one kind of labor rather than another kind, if we can accept the idea that the level of money wages is not arbitrary, but it has uh, definite determinants, then it's possible uh, to start investigating what determines real wages. I see uh, some people uh, smiling over something. I don't know wh uh, we just like you. We just what like the humor you. is in, uh, in the discussion, but uh, the key point is uh, wage rates are not set arbitrarily. Uh, they are based on demand and supply. And in that context, we can now begin to investigate what it is that raises real wages. What is it that makes it possible for the standard of living of the average wage earner to increase? Well, let's consider what are the effects of the improvements in the productivity of labor? What are the effects of improvements in the productivity of labor on the supply of goods. It increases the, real wages, it increases the supply of goods, and uh, what is the effect on prices? Uh, prices will go down. Now, uh, we can uh, <coughs> think of things uh, in terms of uh, two uh, simple and similar formulas. I have I expressed them here uh, in the supplement. Uh, real wages depend on the productivity of labor. Uh, uh, I have these uh, formulas also in the text. Let's see if we can uh, show it there. Okay, here we are. Uh, on page uh, 672. Uh, the average money wage in the economy uh, can be conceived of as equal to uh, total payrolls uh, indicated by D sub L, the demand for labor, divided by S sub L, <coughs> representing uh, the supply of labor employed. S sub L is the supply of labor employed. Uh, w, the average money wage, is equal to D sub L over S sub L. So to concretize this, uh, at the present time, I think we have roughly 125 million workers working. Yes? Okay, so the, you said that um, wages is determined by the demand for labor divided by the supply of labor, right? 
Yeah. Um, all things remain equal. There's yeah. no late, no unions, no artificial like I, anything. I, right? yeah, we, we can allow for the effect of unions in the light of the formula, but go ahead. Oh, I'm, I'm just clarifying. Yeah, I'm okay. sure I'm following the lecture. Okay, yeah. All right, let's say, suppose total payrolls in the economy were uh, $5 trillion, $5,000 billion. And the uh, uh, number of workers employed was 125 million. All right, I believe that that would work out to an employment cost, an average employment cost of $40,000 per worker. 125 million uh, times uh, a thousand is 125 billion. That's uh, the average. Yeah, okay. the employment cost. Uh, you have to realize uh, there's a difference between the wage a worker uh, gets in his paycheck and the uh, cost to the employer of hiring of employing him. Uh, the employment cost includes all of the fringe benefits. It's not just what the worker is paid, but uh, all of the expenses on his behalf such as the employer's contribution to Social Security, to Medicare, uh, whatever else may be involved, uh, workers' compensation, anything of this kind, uh, that's all part of the employment costs. And you can think of that as uh, gross wages. Uh, we uh, typically take home uh, much less than uh, the gross wage, but we could have that. Uh, it makes no difference to an employer whether he would pay the whole uh, employment cost to the employee or he pays a fraction to others and only uh, the remainder to the employee. It's the same expense to him. So now, what we're looking at here is uh, a wage in the sense of the average total employment cost. And that uh, mathematically is equal to uh, the total of payrolls in the economy divided by the number of workers employed. S sub L being the number employed, the supply of labor employed, D sub L, uh, the total payrolls. Now, uh, if the quantity of money in the economic system stayed the same, and uh, the supply of labor employed also stayed the same, what's implied about the average uh, wage, the average gross wage? If the total payrolls, demand for labor, were unchanged, if the numerator uh, in this uh, equation here uh, were unchanged. This is unchanged, and the number of workers employed is unchanged. Then what would be true about the average wage per worker? Unchanged. It would be unchanged. That would be unchanged. Now, what would be the effect uh, to the extent that the output per worker can be increased, and that can be increased uh, by the adoption of labor saving methods of production? Uh, by the improvements in products, the introduction of newer, better products. So suppose at uh, some later point, whether it's five years later or ten years later, whatever, uh, suppose that uh, the same amount of labor performed is now able to produce a larger physical output in terms of number of units and uh, quality of units and better types of units. Okay, uh, let's uh, try to put a number on this. We want to make our work as easy as possible, uh, so uh, we should always work whenever we can uh, with very simple multiples, and two, of course, is the simplest of all multiples. So uh, let's deal with a variety of cases in the light of those formulas, and we'll deal with this uh, first case, A, uh, the money supply, and thus uh, monetary demands for labor and goods, constant uh, population, and thus uh, supply of labor constant. Uh, the only thing changing is the productivity of labor, the output per unit of labor, which is rising. And let us assume enough time has gone by so that the productivity of labor has doubled. Okay, uh, what is the effect on the general level of prices? And think of the same formula that we worked with earlier in the term. Prices would have, right? Prices would have the doubling of the productivity of labor in the face of the same expenditure to buy double the goods, that would have prices. But what would happen to uh, the average money wage? Unchanged. That would be unchanged. Why is it unchanged? Same number of people are employed being, being paid the same amount. Well, we have the same total payrolls, <coughs> the same number of workers employed. So the average money wage is unchanged. But what is implied if, if the average money wage is the same, but prices are halved? Uh, 
wages. Real wages have doubled. Well, this is how improvements in the productivity of labor operate to raise the standard of living from the side of uh, making goods more abundant and prices lower. Uh, Mr. Weatherford. Didn't we decide earlier that supply creates its own demand? So yeah. with the increased supply, would you not have also increased demand for those consumer goods? And okay. since you have if one follows the other, would then consumer price levels be the same? Okay, uh, Mr. Weatherford is raising the question, didn't we establish that uh, aggregate supply creates aggregate demand? Yes, we did, but the kind of demand that it creates is real demand, <coughs> not necessarily monetary demand. And if we had the same quantity of money, we'd have the same monetary demand, but uh, if the same monetary demand now buys double, what kind of real demand is it? It's a doubled real demand. So uh, Say's law is still working here. Say's law works even if there's no change in the quantity of money. The critical thing about Say's law is that only more supply creates more real demand. Now we're seeing here uh, a major corollary of Say's law. We're seeing that the rise in the productivity of labor is what uh, raises real wages. Uh, just as real demand depends on production, real wages depend on production per capita, on production per wage earner. And the way this works is uh, the improvement in production operates to reduce prices relative to wages. That's how it's happening. Yes, uh, so, Mr. So Wilson. to summarize, just to make sure I'm hearing you correctly, what you're saying is the actual, you know, you're basically getting more value out of your dollar because mm -hmm. the real wage in effect is making it more valuable, even though you're getting the same amount of, same yeah. amount of money you're making, but it's stretching it farther because of the cost Yes, of that's right. That's exactly how. Now, uh, the way that most people are thinking of uh, how wages rise, they're not thinking of it in this way. Uh, they're not thinking of uh, their standard of living rising by virtue of the prices they pay falling. How are they thinking of it? Wages. They're thinking of earning more money. They're thinking that the way the standard of living rises is by virtue of earning more money. All right, well, what is mathematically necessary in terms of this formula for the average money wage for the same number of people uh, to earn a higher money wage. What would be necessary if today uh, the average uh, annual wage were $40,000 uh, with 125 million people employed, what would have to happen in order to have 125 million people employed earning 80,000 a year? There'd have to be a doubling of total payrolls. Now, what would be required uh, to achieve a doubling of any major spending aggregate. <coughs> Pardon me? Yes? Investment? Uh, double demand. <coughs> what, what double is required service. to double the monetary demand? More money not in. A larger quantity of money. What makes, uh, think back to the first major proposition uh, we studied in this course, that the volume of spending uh, is governed primarily by the quantity of money. The amount of uh, spending uh, that takes place is determined uh, by, the, the amount of money that is spent is determined uh, primarily by the amount of money that exists. Uh, what would bring about uh, double average money wages for the same population would essentially be a doubling of the quantity of money. But what would that same doubling of the quantity of money be doing to the demand for consumers' goods? Increase. Uh, to what extent would it increase it? Double. On the order of double. All right, and that's case B. Uh, case B here is we have uh, money supply and thus monetary demands rising. Those are the two things changing. And we're going to assume that population and the uh, supply of workers employed, that's unchanged, and the productivity of labor is unchanged. So we have the same number of people employed producing the same output, but uh, we have twice the money being spent to pay wages and twice the money being spent to buy the products. Well, what's the effect on the average money wage? Pardon me? We have twice the total payrolls and the uh, same number of people receiving them. Double, 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 the, uh, double the average money wage, right? Okay, but what is the effect on uh, prices? Up, up. 
Up how much? Double, double. double. Now, if you're earning twice as much and you have to pay prices that are twice as high, what has happened to your real wage? It stayed the same. And real wages, we should realize, uh, perhaps I should have stated this, uh, the average real wage uh, should be conceived of as the average money wage divided by the price level. Hmm. It's the average money wage divided by the price level. If the average money wage doubles and the, re and the, and the price level doubles, there's no improvement in real wages. If the money wage stayed the same and the price level halved, then real wages double. All right, now, case C is a combination of cases A and B. Uh, here we have uh, the money supply going up, uh, the magnitudes of spending will be going up, but we also have uh, productivity rising. And yet, once again, we'll have uh, the population and the number of workers employed, that'll be the same. So now we'll have the same number of workers employed, but uh, they're going to produce, on average, twice as much. And at the same time, uh, there's twice as much money, twice as much being spent in payrolls and to buy consumers' goods. So we have twice the demand for labor. So the numerator is doubled. And we have uh, the same supply of labor. So what's happened to the average money wage? Increase. That's doubled. OK. We have a doubled expenditure for consumers' goods. But we also have a doubled supply of consumers' goods. So what's the effect on the price level? Ups and downs. I'm sorry? Unchanged. The price level would be unchanged. Well, if we have some, you look puzzled why the price level is unchanged. Supply? The supply is doubled. We have a doubled denominator right. and a doubled numerator. Oh, OK. Doubled. So that we have two over two. That's right. uh, unchanged. But uh, <coughs> in the labor market, we have two over one. So money wages double, uh, prices are unchanged. And in this context, uh, people are earning twice as much. Their standard of living has also doubled. So uh, here we have a coincidence of higher monetary earnings uh, with uh, greater real wages. But what is responsible for the rise in real wages here? Why do real wages rise in case C, but not in case B? In both cases, we have a doubling of money wages. I mean, productivity. productivity increases in case C, but not in B. So what is the essential element <coughs> to the rise in real wages? Productivity. The rise in, in the productivity of labor. See, if we didn't have the rise in the productivity of labor, the doubling of money would have doubled prices. When we have the doubling of money and the doubling of productivity, prices stay the same. But notice, what is the distinct contribution of the doubling of productivity uh, two prices uh, compared with what they otherwise would have been. What is the effect of productivity on prices uh, compared with what they otherwise would have been? Lowers them. It's always lowering them. Even when prices end up unchanged, they're unchanged because that's the outcome of one factor, the doubling of money and spending, that's operating to double prices, and it's working in combination with this other factor, the doubling of productivity, which is operating to halve prices. <coughs> Uh, this is analogous, I think, to uh, the way uh, you'd analyze a problem or some problems in physics. Uh, you might have uh, one force operating uh, to push something forward uh, at a certain velocity. If there's another equal force uh, coming in the opposite direction to push it backward, it'll stay where it is. Uh, so uh, something can be unchanged as the result of the operation of two equal opposite forces. And Prices are unchanged as the outcome of the increase in money operating to raise them and the increase in productivity operating to lower them. But it's the increase in productivity that's the key uh, to the rise in real wages. Yes, Mr. That's, Wright. That's where I got confused. Is that the general, even though the, the price remains the same, essentially it is halved because you're able to you're able to buy more with your money. You're able to buy twice as much. You could say the real price the is real halved. Price. The real price is halved. Okay. Uh, the standard of living is doubled, but it's coming from the side of uh, productivity. Now, uh, the only thing that allows the average member of an economy to earn more money year after year is what? Inflation. Pardon me? Inflation. We could, we could say inflation. Maybe that's stating it a little uh, too strictly. Uh, we don't want to be in the position of saying that every possible increase in the quantity of money represents inflation. I think that's uh, taking it a little too far. Uh, I myself used to do that. Uh, I would say 
the limited increases in the quantity of money that you'd have under a gold standard, then you'd have some increase in the quantity of money. I would say we shouldn't call that inflation, but the increase beyond that. But it is the increase in the quantity of money. It's the increase in the quantity of money that is raising the money incomes. The increase in production is operating to lower prices. Now, uh, there's, uh, 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 there's a reason why uh, people, uh, there are actually two reasons why people connect uh, the improvement in their standard of living with the earning of more money. Uh, one reason is uh, there's this uh, coincidence of the two processes. As the productivity of labor is rising, over the same time, the quantity of money is growing, and that is operating to raise money incomes. So the two things are going on together, and it's very easy for people to associate them. But I think there's also another element, which might even uh, be more uh, influential, and this is the fact that if any given individual considers what can he personally do to improve his own standard of living, well, what, what is it that lies within your power as an individual uh, to improve your standard of living? Is it uh, uh, to be confronted with lower prices for what you buy or to earn more money? Earn more money. I think it's to earn more money. That's, uh, that's what's within our power as an individual. Now, when we consider uh, what we can do as an individual, uh, well, the way that, the typical way that an individual would earn more money is by improving his own productivity, uh, becoming more skilled, and uh, these two things uh, will typically go together. Uh, let's say, and here you are, uh, you're in uh, a degree program, and uh, you're hoping once you complete it, uh, that uh, should contribute to your earning more money. And so this is probably before you entered the program, uh, you wanted to earn more money, and you thought, well, what's the best thing I can do to accomplish that? And uh, coming into such a program uh, appeared as the answer. And that's not at all unreasonable. But uh, notice, uh, the reason that uh, this uh, seems so logical is that uh, we can assume pretty much that when a given individual uh, takes such a step uh, to go get additional education, uh, what are the great mass of the people with whom he has been competing? Uh, what are they likely doing or not doing? They already have that level of education. Well, uh, some of them may have it, or whatever they have. We're assuming that uh, the people you're in competition with are more or less standing still. Uh, you're doing what you can. You don't control their actions, and uh, you don't know what they may be up to. And even if you may know what some of them are up to, uh, you have no knowledge of the general mass. So if we can assume that here you are, you as a given individual, you're improving your productivity, and the uh, people with whom you compete are not, well, how, how should that affect uh, your competitive position? You have an improved competitive <coughs> position. And so you could reasonably expect to earn more money on the foundation of an improved competitive position. And again and again, probably more often than not, when individuals improve their productivity, those improvements in their productivity are at the same time improvements in their productivity relative, relative to the productivity of those with whom they compete. Now, what I want to show is that it's the improvement in your relative productivity that is the source of your earning more money. There, there are two sources of individuals earning more money. One is the increase in the quantity of money. That allows everybody to earn more money. What allows uh, specific individuals to earn more money is in addition to the increase in the quantity of money, improvements in their relative productivity. And again and again, when individuals improve their productivity, and at, the, at the same time, it's an improvement in their relative productivity. But if people are improving their productivity across the board, if everybody is improving their productivity to the same extent, uh, can they all be improving their relative productivity? No. No, so can they earn more money uh, by improvements in productivity that don't represent improvements in relative productivity? Suppose uh, everybody were suddenly getting uh, BSM degrees who hadn't gotten them. Uh, what effect do you think that would have on how much more money you'd be able to earn? Neutralized. Uh, it would be neutralized. Uh, then you'd need an MBA. 
And if everybody's getting an MBA, uh, then you need a PhD. Uh, the higher monetary earnings uh, depend on uh, your relative position. Now, when individuals are improving their productivity, usually it'll mean they're also improving their relative productivity. But if it doesn't mean that, if, they're, uh, if there's no improvement in their relative productivity, uh, they may not earn any more. In fact, we've already discussed a, a case where everyone uh, in a given field very substantially improved his productivity. And what happened to them? I got let go. Outsourcing. You got let go. <laughs> <laughs> well, what case did we spend a lot of time on a couple of a, a week ago? I think. Indeed. Where uh, everyone improved his productivity, the they doubled potatoes. their productivity. The potato growers. They doubled their productivity, and they all ended up losing money. Um. Well, that can happen too. And uh, there's a common instance. Uh, you're familiar with the piecework system. Uh, why do unions uh, violently oppose the piecework system? Uh, there's a system where the, uh, the worker gets paid by each piece, so he has a powerful incentive. Each unit he does his work on, he's putting money in his pocket. Well, what does that do to the output from the same number of people? Increase. It can sharply increase it, and then what may very well happen to the piece rate? It goes, it goes down, and it could go down more than the supply is increased, with the result that uh, many of the piece workers are earning less uh, after they've produced more than they did before. They're in the exact same position as the <coughs> potato farmers. So the, these are cases that are generally, people, people are aware of them, where you have the improvements in productivity and the income of certain classes of producers actually falls rather than rises, the money income. So uh, productivity uh, connects with money income only insofar as it improves your relative productivity. And if sometimes uh, increasing the output uh, can cut your relative productivity because you have a relative oversupply of something. Well, the key thing, the, the way the standard of living actually rises is uh, from the side of supply. Uh, if everyone got more productive and no one earned any more money income, they would all still benefit, but in what way? Reduce costs. Through paying lower prices. And that's the way uh, the standard of living uh, actually goes up. Now, this is something uh, not generally seen, and it has application to labor unions. Uh, how do labor unions think uh, they need to raise the standard of living? What's their method? Of, yeah. Their idea is, we'll go out and then we'll raise the wages of our members, and that's how we do it. Now, the, the unions really don't realize that the standard of living, the general standard of living, doesn't rise that way. It rises from the side of goods getting cheaper. And what are the unions doing to the cost of production? Uh, what is the effect of the printer's union on the cost of printed matter? The it's making it higher. What is the effect of that on the real wages of all workers throughout the whole economy who buy printed matter? Decreasing. It's decreasing. Every time uh, the unions are imposing, are opposing uh, improvements in the productivity of labor, however paradoxical it may seem, they're actively combating the rise in real wages without even knowing it, because their whole horizon is limited to what can they do to raise the money wages of their members, and not realize that the real wages of workers in the whole economy <laughs> depends on the prices they have to pay, which the unions are out busily making higher than they need to be. So uh, this is something uh, to think about. All of these things are, I think. So let's uh, take a break here. I only kept you one minute beyond, or two minutes. So let's uh, pick up in 25 minutes.